Well, it's kind of interesting, you know, after Easter Sunday is like a big deal. We had a big deal last Sunday. It was a great Sunday. A lot of people came in for their annual visit, as Devin said. And, uh, you know, this week we're just back to regular church, but I'm excited about that. It's kind of interesting that there's like Easter Sunday. Everybody gets excited about Jesus or something to do with Jesus. And then the next week it's just business as usual. But the reality is for a believer, we learned this last week, that every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. We're constantly celebrating the event that has baffled the world for 21 centuries, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That little scene we just saw when Mary goes to the tomb and finds the tomb empty, she's in disbelief, and when she sees Jesus, she's not even sure who it is. And then she goes and tells the disciples, the people that were closest to him, the Master has risen, it really happened, and they are in disbelief. They can't believe that it actually happened. It's one of these things that is difficult to comprehend, the resurrection, and yet we celebrate it big on Easter, and today is no different. We're going to celebrate the resurrection, except maybe the crowds are a little smaller after Easter. There's no marshmallow peeps, thank God. There are no Cadbury Cadbury eggs, I'm mourning that. No egg hunts, no Easter baskets, no Easter bunnies. How all of those things became associated with the resurrection, I don't even understand that. I'm just glad chocolate's involved. Like, if I have one more excuse to eat chocolate, that makes me happy. But more important than that, I am glad that every single week we get to celebrate something that is significant, that Jesus did not just die on a cross, he rose from the dead. We have to get that in our mind. Christianity is constantly the cross, the cross, the cross. He bore our sins on a cross, the old rugged cross, and we get that. But the most important part of that is that he didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay in the tomb. He rose from the dead. And so we are going to talk about that Jesus is alive and Jesus loves us. And I want to say thanks, first of all, to my friend Devin Hudson for kicking off the series last week on Easter. Would you give him a big hand? I asked Devin to lead this series on Easter because this is important for us as a church. We are working harder than ever behind the scenes to do some things in our church to get ready for our next steps that I believe God is leading us to go on. Some things are unfolding in my heart, but in order for us to get where we're going, we have to know where we're starting from. In order for you to get to a destination, you have to know what the starting point is, and I want us all on the same page, all in the same accord, all, right? In the Bible, it says they were all in one Honda, and the, you know what I'm talking about? We're all in one accord. We're all in agreement that there's one thing that's important. And we talked about it last week. Paul called it, there are things that are of first importance. He mentioned it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's right before 2 Corinthians. And he explains something we call the gospel. Now, I could have preached the message last week and we would have been just fine. But I believe nobody understands the gospel better than my friend Devin. No one is more passionate about him. And I wanted him to teach it. But there are a lot of things in that message that are important to us as a church. And as we unfold this gospel passage in 1 Corinthians 15 for the next few weeks, it's going to be very important that we're all here, that we all lean in, and that we all get the same message, and that we're all on the same page. Because there are a lot of things in the Bible and a lot of things in church that are important, the message is important. Would you agree? I'm going to be honest with you, the messenger, not so much. The message is important. The messenger, not so much. It's important that we sing songs about Jesus. You love the songs this morning we sang this morning about Jesus? Those are important to sing. But the kind of songs we sing, not so much. It could be hymns, it could be rocked up, it could be a blend of both. We could have a choir, we could have robes, we could have, you know, rock bands, they could look like Slayer, whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter as long as it's about Jesus. 
There are lots of things that are important, but there are things that are not so important. Whether we meet in a theater or a building, it's important that we meet. Would you agree? But whether we meet in a building or a theater, or if you're in Africa, you might meet in a hut, or if you're in Haiti, you might meet in a very hot place that you wish you were in hell because it's so hot there. Am I right? It was hot in Haiti, wasn't it? They didn't meet in a building like this. They didn't meet in a church. So there are a lot of things that are important in the Bible. Churches love to take what's not important and raise them to elevations of importance. Whether the rapture of the church is pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, or mid-tribulation. Those kinds of things are really interesting. How many of you even know what they are? Okay, about 12 of you. Okay, They're interesting, but they're probably not that important. Now, they're in the Bible, so they're of some importance, but they're probably not the most important, right? Um, whether we speak in tongues or we see signs or miracles, those are a huge discussion in the church today, okay? You have whole denominations based on one or the other, you know? We believe in the signs of the gifts and the full gospel, and we believe in the full gospel, just not those parts of it, and all this kind of stuff. Those things are interesting, and they are of some importance, but they're not the most important. Should you baptize somebody by immersion or sprinkling? If all you got is a hose, maybe you're going to go with sprinkling. I don't know. There are some things that are interesting, but they're not the most important things. Should you have deacons and elders lead the church? Or should a pastor and staff lead the church? Should you have congregational leadership? All of these things are talked about in the scriptures. They're important, but they're not the most important. We could go on and on and talk about these things. Should we sing hymns? Should we sing praise songs? Should we have Sunday school? Should we have small groups? Should we have uh, Sunday night service or Wednesday night prayer service? Should we have softball teams or should we send out mission teams? All of these things are topics of discussion in a church. They're all things that are interesting in a church, but they're not the most important thing in the church. And so Paul begins 1 Corinthians 15, and he reminds us what's important. So let's look at it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preach to you. Say gospel. Do you know what gospel means? Gospel is the good news. This is the good news. He says, and I want to remind you of the good news that I preached to you, which you received. In other words, hey, I received it from somebody else. I told you and you received it. And now that's the gospel in which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So he says, hey, I want to remind you of something. This is the gospel. And here's what it is. He said, for I delivered to you as of, what's the next words? Now, I delivered to you as, oh, we're on the next page. I'm always one page behind. For I delivered to you as of, what's the next words? First importance. Not second importance, not kind of an important thing, not, hey, let's talk about all the other things churches like to talk about, and then we'll get to this gospel thing. He said, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, and here it is, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, this is the gospel, 101, the foundation of our faith. Dave, Devin talked about it last weekend. It is the good news that Jesus died. Now, it's not just that he died, because a lot of people died, and many of them in that day died in the hands of the Roman crucifixion system. He died for a reason. He died for our sins. It is important for us to understand that, we deserve to die, but Jesus died for us. That is of first importance, Paul says. And then it says he was buried. For three days he was in an airtight tomb. He didn't swoon on the cross and take a little nap and feel better later and come out and say, wow, I'm not surely what happened. I don't really remember the last three days, but I'm feeling better now. Are you guys ready to start a movement? He died. And he was buried. 
He was as dead as a hammer. And it's important to know that. And then he rose from the dead on the third day. Three days later, just like he said he would, many times in the scripture, he rose from the dead, he defeated the grave, he overcame death, it held no power on him because of who he was. He was fully a man, but he was fully God. And all this happened, Paul says, according to the scriptures. The scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, the words that Jesus spoke, we're all about this event. And this is what our faith is based on. The gospel, the good news. And it's what everything else we do in a church hinges on. It doesn't start with whether you like a certain kind of music, so that's the kind of church you're going to go to. It doesn't start with whether you prefer a certain kind of dress style and that's the kind of church you want to go to. It doesn't start whether you like the personality of the preacher or mom and daddy went there or anything else. It starts with the gospel. That Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day and everything else that that church does flows out of that thing. Not only that, it's what our faith is based on. Everything we do in our lives as a believer and what happens. This isn't about just what we do together on Sunday. The gospel is about what happens on Monday. The gospel is about how we conduct ourselves on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And then we come back and gather on Sunday and we talk about it some more and we learn some more about it so that every day that ends in why we can become more like Jesus. The gospel feeds everything. Paul says it's of first importance because everything flows out of it. It is the foundation of our faith and our life as followers. If I want to go to heaven, I need to understand the gospel. I need to understand that Jesus died for my sins, that he really did was buried in the grave. He really was dead, and he really did come back to life like he said he would, or he, he was going to. It's foundational for me to go to heaven. If I want forgiveness of sin, I need to understand the gospel. I need to understand what happened when Jesus was put on a cross that my sin became his sin and God killed him on a tree and therefore my sin died on the tree. The gospel is everything about my life. If I want my marriage to be heavenly, I need to understand what Jesus did for me in the church. And how he treated the church and loved the church and gave his life for it. And as a husband, I need to love my wife like Christ loved the church and give my life for her. If I want a family that's functional and reflects God's intention for a family on earth, I need to understand how the gospel flowed out of a family relationship, the love of a father for his son. My understanding of the gospel not just about the offering plate on Sunday. It affects my finances all the way across the board. It feeds into how I handle money, how I spend, how I save, how I borrow, how I give generously to ensure that others have their needs met. And the gospel is proclaimed and goes forward to other people who haven't heard. The gospel affects everything. And so it's very important for our church as we begin to take our next steps to understand the gospel. I've been telling you for some time now, God has been working in my heart for months. There are some things that are happening that I'm very excited about. And normally, when I get excited about things, I just go. I just load the gun and shoot the bullet and let's all go. Put up a slide. Hey, let's charge hell, man. Let's load the water pistol and let's charge hell. But God said, hey, slow down. Slow your roll. Before we take our next steps as a church together, Let's make sure we're all together. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. Let's make sure we know where we are, like in the book of Acts, that we are really all of one accord. And that's why I've asked you to lean in for the next few weeks, to be here week in and week out, to pay attention, to let us set the stage, because we know something. 
that the world doesn't know. We believe something that the world can't possibly understand. We know that a man died on a cross for everybody's sin and all they have to do is repent from their sin and believe in Him and they will be forgiven and have eternal life. That is the greatest news that's ever been told. And you and I are the stewards of that message. And so we got to get it out. There's more than just that. Once we get it out and somebody receives the message and believes the message, then what do they do? They got to take their next steps. They've got to belong to this family called a church. And then they've got to become who God intended for them to be in the first place. And so we have to begin to, 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 to take the gospel and disciple them, grow their faith, so that they can become more and more like Jesus. We don't want a church full of Sunday spectators, people who just show up, check a box, and say, I did there. We need a church of people who are sold out to the gospel, to people who want to start revolutions and are fully aware of why they do what they do, and they're fully committed to being part of it. We want a church that understands the gospel and is ready to carry out the gospel, the good news, and all that it means to all of the world, beginning in our homes and extending out from there. And so we're laying a foundation for the next four weeks of what the gospel really means, what it implies, so that when the time is right, we're ready together to take our next steps as a church. So if you have your Bibles in 1 Corinthians 15, remember that's the backdrop of this. Paul said the gospel is that, first of all, Jesus what? Died. Say that. Jesus died. Jesus died for our sins. After Jesus died for our sins, He was buried. And on the third day, He rose again according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel that has been passed down from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, until we receive it. Now we are stewards of it, and now we need to learn more about it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now... If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? Some of the people in Paul's day, especially the church in Corinth, did not believe in a resurrection. Once you die, you go into the ground, that's the end of it. And so they taught that, There was no resurrection and there was no shortage of people who believed that. And because they believed there was no resurrection, they believed Jesus had not risen. Because if there's no resurrection from the dead, then there's no way Jesus could have resurrected. Now, Paul's letter is only a few years removed from the date of the resurrection. If you remember last week, Paul said that He said there were some people who saw Jesus. First, there were the 12. Now, when we think of the 12, we're like, well, didn't Judas die? He went out and hung himself, so he didn't see the resurrection. No, they selected another guy. They they threw dice, cast lots, whatever that was. They chose a guy named Matthias. Those 12 people saw Jesus alive. And Paul says, if you don't believe me, they're still around. Go ask them. He said, not only them, there were 500 other people. Most of them are still alive. If you don't believe me, go ask them. They saw Jesus alive. 512 people saw him alive. And then he says something that's crazy. He said, and then I saw him alive. You got to get this in your mind. Paul is the guy who hated Christians. He persecuted Christians. He saw to it that they were imprisoned Some of them impaled or stoned to death. He was like the ISIS of his day, trying to destroy Christianity. And he says, I saw him alive, and now I'm telling you, he was dead, he was buried, and he's been resurrected, and you should follow him. 513 people saw him alive. But some in the church are saying, no. He didn't actually rise from the dead. You know, there's people who say that today. Not just people who aren't Christians. 
People would call themselves Christians, even pastors, even theologians, even denominational leaders. They believed there was a Jesus. They believed he was some kind of a deity. They believed he was a prophet who spoke great things and taught us how to live on this earth and that he did die a Roman crucifixion, but that's kind of where the story ends for them. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead physically. Many of them believe that his followers kind of just made up the story to perpetuate Jesus' teachings or that their followers were so deceived by Jesus that when the tomb was empty, they just believed he rose. And so they believed it so much they propagated the story until other people believe it. But now here we are 2,000 later, and 2,000 years later, there are a lot of Christians who do not believe this. You say, well, how many is a lot? It's a lot. I did a little bit of research in mainstream Christianity. Mainstream Christianity, 20 to 30 percent of pastors don't believe in the resurrection. In some denominations, and you'll find many of them in the South, in the Bible Belt, 50% do not believe Jesus rose from the dead. Among Christians in America, or let me say among Americans, and understand when you ask Americans if they're Christians, 85% of them, whether they've ever darkened the door of a church or not, since they're not Muslims, they're Christians, right? 85% of them who've who say they're Christians, do not believe there is such a thing as a resurrection from the dead. 85%. That includes the ones who do go to church. They don't believe there is a resurrection from the dead. They believe that when the body dies, it goes into the grave and it rots. But you and I need to understand the gospel hinges on the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to look at Paul's logic and his reasoning here. First, he says, if there is no resurrection, there is no foundation. If there is no resurrection, there is no foundation for any of this. He says in verse number 12, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as risen from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then even Christ has never been risen. I think I get why people might not believe in the resurrection. I've never seen anybody rise from the dead. Have you? I mean, I've been to a lot of funerals. I preached one yesterday. I was at a graveyard yesterday. I've been to the casket. I've seen open caskets. I've seen closed caskets. Never one single time have I seen anybody in the casket get up and go, hey, I feel okay, let's go play some golf. Right? Now, I've kind of always wanted to go, I think I saw his leg move. But I've never seen anybody get up. There's no proof in this world that a resurrection can actually happen. But Paul says, If the body doesn't resurrect, and that includes all of us, if our bodies will not resurrect, Jesus had a human body. And if a human body cannot resurrect, then Jesus did not resurrect. And if Jesus did not resurrect, then we got a serious issue because Jesus said, if you destroy this temple, meaning my body, in three days, I will raise it up again. He said, as Jonah was in the heart of the earth, for three days, or in the belly of a whale, for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He says, I am going to rise from the dead. If there's no resurrection from the dead, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Jesus is a liar on at least two accounts. And maybe more. And that makes the whole thing a lie. The resurrection is the foundation of it all. And it's like a house built on sand, and if water washes it out, what does it do? It crumbles. It falls. Without the resurrection, Jesus is no different than Buddha. He's no different than Hare Krishna. 
He's no different than Mahatma Gandhi. He's no different than Muhammad. He is just another dead religious leader who taught us some pretty good things to tell us how to live on this earth, but he gives us no way to get from life on this earth to life after death. The whole thing crumbles on the resurrection because there's no foundation. Second, if there's no resurrection, there's no faith. If there's no resurrection, there is no faith. Verse 14 goes on to say, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it's true the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Now, that's kind of a long way, and Paul's kind of legal, and he kind of thinks really big of saying, hey, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus didn't raise. If Jesus didn't raise, then guess what? We're all in trouble. There's no reason for your faith. We're preaching in vain, and your faith is in vain, and you're really, really hosed. It's a Greek word. Hosed. Vain is really a Greek word that means empty, meaningless, fruitless, having no effect. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, Paul is saying what I do every Sunday is useless. And you might as well turn on the television and watch the O channel all your life. Pick up a few tidbits from Oprah. Get a few good things from Ellen. Get some awesome stuff from Dr. Phil. Because my preaching is in vain. Not only that, your faith is in vain. It's a waste of time. There's not another life. You better make the most out of this one because you only get one. Why shouldn't you just live it the way you want to? Morality goes out the window. If there's no faith. I mean, if there's no faith, I'm going to have more fun. And I'm going to have it at your expense. And I'm going to take what you got. That's why I, I talk to people who are atheists all the time. We talk about faith. I say, hey, if there's no faith, I'm just going to take what you got and make it mine. If there's no God that's going to judge me, if there's no afterlife that I'm going to give an account for, then why don't I just make everything in this life and I'm going to take what you got. And if I want your wife, if I want your kids, if I want your money, if I want your car, I'll just slaughter everything to get what I want. Because there's no faith. There's no afterlife. Even if Christianity was a good religion, after, without the resurrection, Paul says, wait a minute. We've been misrepresenting God. Because what we've been saying is, God raised him from the dead. But he's not really raised from the dead. So we've been kind of lying about God and there are some scriptures where God said he was going to do this. And so God's kind of been lying about himself. So he's really not God. He's just kind of God or somebody. He's like the magical fairy up in the sky who grants wishes to people who pray that he likes. And he zaps people he doesn't because he's mean. That's what he's saying. It doesn't really matter. Your faith is in vain. And if Jesus lied about the resurrection and God lied about the resurrection, what else did they lie about? You know, when you go to a courtroom, they put a guy on the witness stand. If that guy is telling the truth, they try to find out something else he's lying about. And if they can discredit him by proving that he lied about something in the past, that means he might be lying about his testimony on the witness stand and they dismiss his testimony because he's been found out a liar. And so if Jesus lied about the resurrection and God lied about the resurrection and Paul lied about the resurrection, what else is lied about? So it's all in vain. So let's all pack up and let's go home because it's baseball season and NASCAR season. There must be something more fun to do. 
If there is no resurrection, there's no foundation. If there is no resurrection, there's no faith. And here's a big one. If there is no resurrection, there is no forgiveness. If there's no resurrection, there's no forgiveness. I want you to look how Paul goes on to make his argument. This is where the rubber starts to meet the roads. He said, and if Christ has been not raised, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your what? Sins. If Jesus didn't rise, okay, great. Jesus died on a tree. God put all the sin on him. He was up there. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is finished. Take him down. Put him in the grave. Anoint the body. Everything's good. But if he did not raise from the dead, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. That's a big problem. He takes us back to the crux of the gospel. The need for humanity. We live in a fallen, broken world. And Jesus was murdered on a cross for our sin. And we need to understand, in the Roman Empire, that was an everyday occurrence. The roads were lined, the hills were lined with Roman crucifixes, with people who were criminals or charged as criminals, so the world could see, you do not defy the Roman government. We will hang you as an example. It was an everyday occurrence. Jesus was one of many who had been crucified. An innocent who died. But he died for our sins because we're sinners. The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, everybody has sinned and fallen short of who God is and what God wants. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no not one. Think of the best person you know. The very best person you know. The model for morality and righteousness. Yesterday I preached at a funeral. We laid to rest a very dear lady. One of the kindest, most gentlest people I know. Raised an awesome family. If you want to stack her up, you could stack her up against anybody. God says there is none righteous. No, not one. That included her. That includes me. And the Bible says there's a problem with that. Because the wages of sin is death. The payment I must pay because of my sin is death. And so I need someone to pay it for me if I'm not willing to pay it myself. And the Bible says that Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. It's an exchange system. Jesus said, I'll take my life, which is perfect, and exchange it for your life, which is imperfect, so that you can be righteous and perfect. That is the best deal in the world. And we need to understand that. My sin is worthy of death. I need a way to fix it. I need a way to wipe it out. There is no way I can be good enough to fix my sin problem. There is no way we can slaughter enough animals and sprinkle their blood on an altar to fix a sin problem. They're really tasty with barbecue sauce, but it doesn't fix a sin problem. Joining a church won't fix your sin problem. Getting baptized won't fix your sin problem. Doing good things and serving and giving away your money won't fix the sin problem. But God said, I have a solution to the sin problem. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him would never perish, but have eternal life. Resurrection fixes the sin problem. And He became a substitute for our sin. And He proved it. Not by dying, but 
by coming back from the dead. So with the resurrection, I can be assured that when I trust Christ's work on a cross, that he became sin for me, I have forgiveness of sin. And understand this. This is something you should write down or tweet or Facebook. Because of his life after death that I have forgiveness, not because of his death after his life. Not because of his death, because of his life after his death that I know I have forgiveness, that I know I'm going to heaven because I know I'm coming out of the grave one day. You see, that's the last thing. There's no resurrection, there's no future. There's no resurrection, there's no future. Paul says without the resurrection, there's no foundation, it hinges on it. He says there's no faith, it hinges on it. We might as well believe in the Easter bunny. There's no forgiveness, we are dead in our sin, we are doomed to die. But that is not the end. He says if Christ be not raised, look at this, verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who are believers, who have died, have perished. They're gone. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I have no hope for a future. But because Jesus rose from the dead, I got hope for a glorious future. Yesterday I had the opportunity to preach a funeral for a dear friend. Paul Pittman, many of you know him. His mother passed away. I've done a lot of funerals as a pastor of Revolution. I don't like doing them. They're better than weddings. At weddings, people kind of get upset. They find something wrong. Usually there's two people that are mad, the bride and the mother of the bride. Funerals are way better because everyone is sad and you can say anything and it'll make them happy. They don't complain that you did a bad job. One time I was doing a funeral and, you know, I use my iPad instead of a Bible. It's just easier for me to read on that for some reason. And I was doing a funeral and I didn't want to take my iPad out to the gravesite, So I pulled up the scriptures on my iPhone and I was about to do the funeral and I turned around, and you know how they put at the graveside this fake carpet around the, the hole in the ground? And I tripped, and I dropped my iPhone in the grave, <laughs> under the casket. So I had to go get my Bible and figure out what I was going to say and read everything. And the whole time I'm sitting there reading that, I'm looking down there, where's that iPhone at, and how are we going to get it out? <laughs> of course, at the end of the story, I had to tell them, i, I got to tell you something funny and your dad might get a life out of this for eternity, but uh, if any of you want to call him later, my phone's down there, and here's my number. So yesterday when I did the funeral, I made sure I had a paper Bible, and that's how I started it. I said, now, I'm reading using my paper Bible today because I lost the iPhone last time, and this is a brand new one, and I'm not going to lose it today. We got a good laugh, but that wasn't the point for being there. The point was to let them know there was a future. That death wasn't the end. That something else was coming. Yesterday I could tell people the story and make them laugh because they were mourning. But I wanted them to have hope. So I took my Bible and I read them this passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. Paul says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. In other words, if you're a believer, one day you're going to die and somebody is going to be grieved about that if they don't have hope. But that's not the end. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and that he was raised to life again, 
we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. And we tell you this directly from the Lord. He said, I'm not reading the Old Testament scriptures. I didn't find it in a passage someplace. Jesus himself told us this when he said that when the Lord returns, we will, we will not meet him ahead of those who have died. The people who have gone before us get a special privilege. For when the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, the voice of the archangel will sound, the trumpet of God will be heard, and first the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. There is a resurrection coming. There is a future coming. There is hope that you and I can have because Jesus rose from the dead and as sure as he rose from the dead, he's coming back to get us. And that's what matters. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? Come to church, sing some songs, go home. Maybe there's something else we should do. Back in the 80s, there was a little movie called E.T. Anybody remember that? E.T., phone home. In the movie E.T., the government got a hold of him, experimented on him, and E.T. died. Elliot was a little bit sad. I want you to see what happened at the end. Spoiler alert. When his alien friend rose from the dead, he had to tell somebody, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. 
He is risen from the dead and he's alive. Can I ask you a question today? Do you believe the gospel? That Jesus died for your sin? That he paid the ultimate price and died on a cross, a horrible, excruciating death, so that you could be forgiven? Do you believe he was buried in a tomb and that he really did die as dead as a rock? Three days later, he came out alive. What are you going to do with that good news? The good news is he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And you and I have the responsibility to shout it from every corner, every housetop, every rooftop, every workplace, every school, every place we can go. That is our job to tell people he is alive. But it only happens if he's alive in your heart. Would you bow your head with me, Father? We thank you that your son is alive. God, this isn't an alien story made up by Hollywood. This is a story told by the Spirit of God. That Jesus Christ, the God-man, came into this world and lived a sinless life and was crucified on a tree for my sin. He died an excruciatingly horrible death and was buried in a tomb for three days and guarded so that no one could get him out and tell a story. Three days later, by the power of the God of the universe, the power of the Spirit that dwells inside of us raised him from the dead. And because of that, we have a foundation for our faith. Because of that, we have a reason to live, God. We have a story to tell. We have forgiveness and eternal life. And we have a future. A future beyond the grave. Because you're alive. Thank you, Lord Jesus might be somebody here who doesn't know where they're going to spend their future. Today would be a great day for you to decide, I want to spend it with Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. I believe the story that he went into the grave and that, more importantly, I believe he rose the third day. I'm sorry for what I've done. And now I trust him to save my soul, to forgive my sin, and give me eternal life. If that's your prayer today, we sure would love to help you take your next steps with him. The next steps card, you could fill out your name, check the box, leave it at the next steps table. We'll get in touch with you and tell you how you could take your next steps with Jesus. We love you and we thank you for being here today.